throwing shade on me. I just, did I forget to stir this? It doesn't, I don't know. Stir it! Action. Fuck it. Man! <clears throat> Hello everybody and welcome to English 332. I am your host, Professor Matt Cohen, and this, my friends, is the birth of the American novel. I'm feeling good today. I've got all kinds of exciting stuff for you, including this 1984 Nebraska Huskers football team autographed football. Look, there's Tom Osborne right on there. Charlie McBride. I'm going to give that to our secretary, Leanne, who's retiring this year. It was a tragic loss. She's so awesome. I tried to bribe her to stay. And unfortunately, it turns out that's against state law. Today we're talking about realism. We're breaking our definition of the novel a little bit, not gonna lie. We're focusing on a story called Life in the Iron Mills by Rebecca Harding Davis. You could call it a longish short story or um, you could call it a very short novel, but we're reading it because it features a distilled version of the most important new artistic movement to hit the United States in the 19th century, realism. Uh, first, let's take a look at Davis after appreciating the first slide of the PowerPoint, which features my office hours. Come see me. If you look at the next slide, you'll see a picture of Rebecca Harding Davis along with two bald dudes who are the most important figures in realism according to the canon. Rebecca Harding Davis up there was born on June 24th, 1831 in Washington, Pennsylvania. She spent the first five years of her life in Huntsville, Alabama, so we're also starting to turn our attention to Southern writers. Her family moved to Wheeling, Virginia after that, and later that part of Virginia was called West Virginia after the Civil War. She lived there until her marriage. She graduated with honors from Washington Female Seminary in 1848. Very little is actually known about the period of her life between 1848 and 61, which is when she published her first and most significant work, Life in the Iron Mills. It's a startling story about the laboring class and this book began her pioneer work as a writer of realistic fiction. She didn't just write fiction, though. She also wrote essays on a variety of social concerns, very often on women's issues, for example. And she wrote for a number of newspapers, periodicals. She was read nationally by lots and lots of folks. And toward the end of her life, you take a look at the next slide. Look at that handsome devil. Her fame was eclipsed toward the end of her life by that of her son, Richard Harding Davis, who had become a glamorous celebrity, a novelist, a journalist. Although she had been well known in her time, Davis virtually disappeared for almost 80 years. Tilly Olson discovered Davis's first book, serialized in musty coverless copies of the Atlantic Monthly in an Omaha junk shop. Since the rescue of this story, Life in the Iron Mills, uh, she's been climbing in canonical stature. But even still, Davis's work has gotten mixed reviews from critics. But I don't know. Everybody I've ever taught this to really found it enjoyable and challenging and difficult and found it a kind of a break from some of the, the style and the tone of the stuff that we've read before. It's also a really grim confrontation of the realities in America at her time. And so it's got a kind of dark charm to it, you might say. Now, the generic niche that this is described in is usually called realism. It does seem sort of naturalistic. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the lecture. But most scholars now recognize Davis as the realist writer whose approach to writing about the commonplace preceded more famous efforts by those two bald dudes in the previous slide, Henry James or William Dean Howells, who a couple of decades later would begin to formulate um, officially the creed of realism. I'll come back to that formal definition in just a minute. Now, we have seen activist fiction before with the killers. Life in the Iron Mills has that kind of criticism of society too. But where Lepard told us exactly what needed to be done about it, right, to fix the problem of too many prisons or solitary confinement, in Davis's story, it's a little bit less clear what we're supposed to do exactly. 
we're left kind of having to work that out for ourselves in many ways. It's a bit more like how things work in real life. Problems come your way and everybody else tells you what to do about it, but you're like, yeah, I'm not really sure that's the answer. This is the kind of worldview that gets presented by this story. There's no doubt that it's still a story, though. It's clearly a tragedy, for example. It borrows from older traditions of writing. It uses a sentimental mode a little bit in here as well, a romantic mode. But for the most part, it relentlessly turns a hard light on a major social problem, the negative effects of the industrialized factory system. Women's labor in the United States' many new large-scale mechanized factories or mills at this time was a fascination for some, and it was a scandal for others. Take a look at your next slide. Tourists visited factories to witness the latest technological wonders, but they also came out of curiosity to see if the stories that they'd heard in the news about long working hours, labor exploitation, child labor, and dangerous or unsanitary conditions were true. This story revolves around one such scene, but it goes where tourists never would, to trace the roots of the factory labor system in the exploitation of new immigrants to America and the greed of factory owners. Now, if you've done this kind of work, um, take a look at the next slide. There's a picture by Winslow Homer of, uh, of a young girl working one of these machines. And if you've done this kind of work, you know how painful it can be and how dangerous it can be. People lost fingers and hands to machines like the one that the Bob and girl here is working on. Um, this is a machine like the one that Deb, the female character, the lead female character in Life in the Iron Mills, is working. Um, and you can see this girl is young. During Davis's era, there was very little oversight of major employers and child labor, 12-hour shifts. These were common. The industry, of course, put out propaganda to fight this image of itself as exploitative. And if you take a look at the next slide, uh, you'll see a kind of industry uh, version of this same scene. This idealistic picture of a girl working a mechanized loom at a textile factory. She's just kind of leaning on it, right? It's as if the thing simply runs itself. She doesn't have to stick her hands into it and risk her life. Notice that the background is very light. There's, there's a, a hanging in the background so you can't see uh, all the other folks who are working in here. Uh, doesn't depict the dark, ill-ventilated spaces that were common in machine loom mills. And of course, pictures like this can't depict the long working hours. But those, as far as investors were concerned, were precisely what made mills profitable. Take a look at the next slide. The narrator of Davis's story tells us this. Not many, even of the inhabitants of a manufacturing town, know the vast machinery of system by which the bodies of workmen are governed that goes on unceasingly from year to year. Machines, the narrator suggests, have taken over not just the work of weaving or making iron, but the entire process of producing things, the formerly human interactions in which bosses watched out for their workers' livelihoods, not just for their profits and their paychecks. If you've ever punched a time clock, you have participated in a regime of time-controlled profit. Take a look at the next slide. Here's a table, uh, a timetable of the Lowell iron mills, for example, and working hours um, over the months of the year. Uh, that regime, that, that time clock system, got its start during the period that we're reading about with this story. Numbers came to dominate. As the story depicts in the case of a reporter who comes to the iron mills to get the story, take a look at your next slide. There's that quotation from early on in the story. The overseer was talking of net profits giving, in fact, a schedule of the annual business of the firm to a reporter for one of the city papers, getting up a series of reviews of the leading manufactories. The city papers. Far from rural Virginia, the story is told that all is well. Everything is profitable, even generous to those new immigrants who needed jobs, after all. But on the ground, the reality is different. If you read the numbers closely, you could probably get an idea of how many life hours it took to produce statistics like these in the next slide. And when you look at engravings, pictures of the mills, such as in the next slide, for example, you see all those smokestacks, but you don't get a sense of the environmental devastation they're causing, the pollution that chokes the lungs of the workers in those same mills. Davis's story, which begins with exactly that sense of clogging choking, pervasive, smoky atmosphere, 
She suggests that the newspaper man's story for the city readers and the company's bragging about its productivity and statistical tables are both wrong. Journalism and statistics are both misrepresentations of the truth. Fiction, on the other hand, has the power to tell a fuller story and an uglier one. Fiction can change the world by making people sympathize with the workers, making them question their own rationalizations about the benefits and the costs of industrialization. But fiction can't do that, Davis implies with this story, unless it gives up certain of its artistic habits, unless it embraces a new approach different from the ones that our writers have been using up to now. And that approach goes by the name of realism. Take a look at the next slide. Here's a quotation from Amy Kaplan on here. She's an American literary critic. She says, realism cannot be understood only in relation to the world that it represents. It is also a debate within the novel form with competing modes of representation. We all know this at some level, right? That, that what we're getting in a story isn't actually the truth. It is actually processed through the mind of a writer, that the writer uses techniques to try to make us feel like what we're reading is true, like it's absolutely accurate, um, that things seem so real that they must have happened, yet we know it's fiction. It's an illusion. Remember all those people going to Charlotte Temple's grave? So the question is, what are those techniques by which writers create that illusion? What does make this kind of writing different, and how was it becoming so convincing, so popular? So take a look at your next slide. I've tried to outline some of the main features uh, that happen in literary realism. This term refers to the trend toward depictions of contemporary life and society as they were. In the spirit of general realism, realist authors chose to depict everyday and uninteresting activities and experiences instead of a sensationalized, romanticized, or sentimentalized presentation. The didacticism of Charlotte Temple was regarded by these folks as a relic of the early stages of the novel. Although in Life in the Iron Mills, you do see a little bit of that, because it's still early in the days of literary realism. So we look at some of these standards, right? Settings are meticulously described in tremendous detail. Before we even get characters in this short story, for example, we're going to get uh, a very long and very intense description of the setting, and we'll revert to that multiple times. It's everyday folks, rather than the rich and the popular or the powerful, who are the subjects of the stories. Um, the happy ending, right? Usually everybody gets married at the end, the bells ring, everybody smiles. That's kind of gone. It's replaced by endings that are a little bit more like what happens in everyday life. So, yeah, very often death, but sometimes just a kind of like, oh, well, things were all right, it wasn't as good as anybody expected, that sort of thing. Characters are extensively developed, and they evolve in complex ways. Most works of literary realism are very, very long books, and one of the reasons they are so long is that they are developing characters very, very deeply, and we're following their change over time as they confront new contexts and new challenges in their lives. Consequently, the plots avoid the supernatural, right? There's very little kind of, well, either religious or uh, supernatural kinds of, of um, uh, of events that happen in these stories. Allegory, parable, Nathaniel Hawthorne's favorite things, these are set aside, and instead you have a social message of some kind. Even if it's not super clear what the what political stance you would take, there is some sense that like something needs to be fixed in the world, and you, reader, can do something about it by changing your mind. So those are kind of the major things that realist writers will tend to do. Many elements of life in the iron mills are distinctively realist. Settings are meticulously described like this. The characters are very similar. It does not have a happy ending. Sorry, spoiler, if you didn't get to the end of it. Um, right, there's no, there's very little supernatural agency. There's the Quaker woman who comes in at the end and kind of helps Deb out. But it's still described as like a day-by-day -day transformation in Deb's life, in which she has to take a long time to get over having lost Hugh and to come to uh, a different kind of life. Do um, you remember that old rule for art from the 18th century, which we started with when we talked about Charlotte Temple, that art should be designed to delight and instruct? Well, as you may have noticed while reading this story, there's precious little delight to be had. 
and it's even kind of hard to figure out exactly what kind of instruction we're getting. The realist writers go even farther than that, though, in challenging older ideas about how form and style should work. Consider the passage in the next slide about Deb, which references the picturesque. We've talked about the picturesque a lot. Perhaps, Davis writes, if she had possessed an artist's eye, the picturesque oddity of the scene might have made her step stagger less, and the path seem shorter. But to her, the mills were only somewhat devilish to look at by night." You know, this is a, a kind of violent undoing of arguments about the power of aesthetics, of the picturesque, to, to transform people's minds. She's saying, you know, hey, there's nothing, right, in that aesthetic world that can make this woman's life better. There's, there's no appreciation of beauty or the picturesque that's going to, going to cheer her up, given her circumstances. So she's, so she's suggesting that, that that old way of writing just isn't going to get it done. Maybe there's a hint of the sublime in the depiction of the mills, but the picturesque is completely thrown out. Even the sublimity of Wolf's death at the end of the story is undermined by the depiction of his slow bleeding suicide and the everyday details of that part of the description. Now, as for the beautiful, there is that mention in that second quotation on that slide of the line of beauty, but it's only to explain that there is no such line, no such beauty in Wolf's slag sculpture. Like realism, Wolf's sculptures take ugly materials and confront us with the ugly realities that can be made of them. Let me be clear, what Wolf is depicted as doing with his slag, taking this cast-off material to try to express his reality, is a symbol of what Rebecca Harding Davis is doing with her story, taking everyday ugly realities and turning them into a story that expresses a human tragedy in the hopes of changing readers' attitudes. Susanna Rosen would have been appalled. Many readers were shocked. How are we doing on time? We got about 10 minutes. Sweet, we're fucking flying. Mm -hmm. All right, let's plow right ahead. Realism was, like most of the other literary aesthetics we've been studying this semester, an international phenomenon. It began with French writers and painters, bastards. Honoré de Balzac is often credited with pioneering realism in French literature. He used extensive details, scenes familiar to his readers, social dramas, and characters that recur from novel to novel. Gustave Flaubert is typical too, writing in simple prose and including details about everyday life. The English writer George Eliot's novel Middlemarch was an internationally famous example of the realist tradition. Hers is the primary example of 19th century realism's role in naturalizing the kind of burgeoning capitalist marketplace, kind of like Hawthorne's Blythedale Romance or Rosen's Charlotte Temple. These novels are directed firmly at a middle-class readership, and I think you'll feel that in Life in the Iron Mills. You kind of think about who's she writing for, who's she trying to appeal to, what assumptions is she making about your status as you're reading this story. William Dean Howells, whose portrait we saw earlier, would become the most influential of American authors to bring a realist aesthetic to the literature of the United States. Now, he was from the Midwest, he was from Ohio, but he wrote stories about 1850s Boston and more broadly Northeastern upper crust life as it related to middle class life. And this is really interested in middle class folks who come to the big city and are striving to kind of become elites or become popular and stuff like that. His novel, The Rise of Silas Lapham, depicts a man from a rural area who makes a fortune, moves to the city, and then falls from materialistic success, at least in part because of his social mistakes. The novel ends with his return to the farm that he left behind. Here's a passage from the novel in your next slide. I just want to give you a more concrete sense of what I mean in terms of style, in terms of what actually happens in line to line on the page when I talk about the literary techniques of realism. After a week, Mrs. Lapham returned, leaving Irene alone at the old homestead in Vermont. She's comfortable there, as comfortable as she can be anywhere, as I guess, she said to her husband as they drove together from the station, where he had met her in obedience to her telegraphic summons. She keeps herself busy helping about the house. She goes round amongst the hands in their houses. There's sickness, and you know how helpful she is where there's sickness. She don't complain any. I don't know as I've heard a word out of her mouth since we left home, but I'm afraid it'll wear on her, Silas. Oh, don't look over and above well yourself, Persis, said her husband kindly. Don't talk about me. 
What I want to know is whether you can't get the time to run off with her somewhere. I wrote to you about Dubuque. She'll work herself down, I'm afraid, and then I don't know if she'll be over it. But if she could go off and be amused, see new people. I could make the time, said Lapham, if I had to. But as it happens, I've got to go out west on business. I'll tell you about it, and I'll take Irene along. Good, said his wife. That's about the best thing I've heard yet. Where are you going? Out Dubuque way. Anything matter with Bill's folks? No, it's business. How's Penn? I guess she ain't much better than Irene. Whew. Sound a lot like the boring talk between you and your parents that used to happen when you were on long car rides and made you fall asleep. It's hard to imagine anybody making money off of this kind of writing. Right? Think, think back to that conversation right between the Temples talking about Charlotte and her birthday. Right? This is the same theme of the conversation. There's no energy in this all, at all, sexual or otherwise. Forget it. But you can see here in the dialogue an attempt to depict the regional specificity of how people talk, and not to interrupt, as Hawthorne would do, with a speculation about what it means that they're saying what they're saying. In an 1884 critical essay called The Art of Fiction, Henry James, the other bald guy earlier on, a culture leader in the literary world of the time, claims that this focus on precision is something every novelist needed to do in order to be relevant. He says, the solidity of speculation, the solid, wow. He says, the solidity of specification was the novel's supreme virtue. Dialect writing is a good example of a technique that realist writers use to create an illusion of a specific place and time and group of people. You see that a little bit with Mrs. Lapham's talk in here. Anywheres, for example, she says, don't know as, that kind of thing. Dialect writing, if you take a look at your next slide, there's a definition of it, is the manipulation of standard English rules of grammar, style, and spelling in order to simulate the particular accent, speech pattern, or word choices of a character. This manipulation usually attempts to simulate the way a group of people, so a race, an ethnic group, a nation, sometimes a religious group, all talk. Note that while religious minorities can be included in this, um, there is a little bit of simulation in Davis's case, right, of uh, the speech of the Quaker woman at the very end. The, she says, um, and she uses very studiously simple phrases. Um, she doesn't speak at length, but that's a Quaker characteristic. Um, so that won't always involve misspelling the words, it might just involve um, the, uh, the phrasing. Davis also simulates the accents of her Irish and Welsh immigrant characters and to an extent of the mulatto character by misspelling words, forcing us to approach words phonetically first and then uh, after that to kind of think about what the words mean. Hugh Wolfe in his outburst to Deb about the significance of his life, momentarily stops being written in dialect, though he has been up to this point. Look at your next slide. This is a quotation from page 41. Look at me, he said to Deborah, with a low, bitter laugh, striking his puny chest savagely. What am I worth, Deb? Is it my fault that I am no better? My fault? My fault? And then, just seconds, like two sentences later, he's back to speaking in dialect. There, God forgive me, woman. Things go harder with you nor me. This is a sure sign that something strange is going on. In this moment, Hugh's particularness, his status as an immigrant and uneducated, gets downplayed as his words are rendered just like those of the middle-class visitors to the mill. He's savage in his gestures, but utterly human and civilized in his speech, but just for a moment. And this clear manipulation of our feelings, this breaking of the immersive barrier of dialect illusion, leads me to my central point about realism and how we need to go about reading it. Though the literary approach that I'm describing here is called realism, it's important to remember it does not mean that what you are reading is real. Like the other artistic modes that we've encountered, this one is a construction. It is something made. It's not a window onto real life. Indeed, some of the most meticulously crafted illusions are the ones that realist writers create. And what's more, it's not as if the moralism of some of the other modes that we have been reading is gone. There are still arguments being made by realist fictions. They still work to offer solutions, or fantasy solutions, to anxious 19th century readers who were worried about race, about religion, gender instability, economic fluctuation, changes in how social class was working, and so on. Whether the culture of the United States was even a culture, a single culture, whether the nation meant anything, 
Whether the United States was right or wrong in the war on Mexico, or later in the Spanish-American War, or in the Indian Wars, or in maintaining slavery, in accepting so many new immigrant populations, or whether old money or new money made you a more solid, elite person, in the 19th century, you could add all of these questions to the usual ones about where your daily bread was coming from and whether your soul was saved. Now, there was eventually a reaction to this trend of realism, and it was called naturalism. It took things one step farther, away from moral conclusions and more toward the idea that some giant system, the system of nature or the system of heredity, was in fact controlling everything. But realism continued to be a powerful force and at the same time, writers began to combine different styles of writing to ask hard questions about America and where it was headed. Now, next time, we're going to be reading an example of one of these combinations. Sutton Griggs' book, Imperium in Imperio. This one combines didacticism, realism, and sentimentalism, and it asks tough questions about the United States from the standpoint of black America. Imperium and Imperio, like life in the iron mills or the killers, takes all of these questions to an explicitly political level. These forms and styles of writing were powerful tools for African American writers, and in the hands of Sutton Griggs, they produce fascinating, riveting results. I hope you enjoy reading it. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. I got a little grain to my voice this morning, that's nice. Maybe I can sing Johnny Cash. Okay.